Okay. Now I'm going to tip into your minds a little bit now and see if I can figure out how you think. Has it occurred to any of you when you come in a place like this that some of these artifacts, especially some of the really big ones, might not even be real? Has that occurred to you? I think that'd be a reasonable thought. Well, let me tell you something right now. Every single airplane in this building is a real airplane that has already flown, all right, except one. That little Wright Brothers replica, 1908 type replica right over there, has not yet flown, but it isn't owned by us. It's owned by a guy who built that replica right here in the state of Virginia, and he's gonna take it back one of these days and fly it. But every other one is a real airplane that has had a complete life in flight. The next question follows naturally. Are they still viable? Eh, no. That is not our concept. Can you imagine how hard it would be to get one of these out of this building? You'd have to take the building down. You would. How did you get it in? Painstakingly, one at a time, in a very carefully choreographed sequence. Okay? No, we don't intend to ever fly them again, though. Yeah, I think you have some outside. Not sure. You might have been confusing though with the plane that's there now, which is its sister airplane. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay, here we go. The plane in front of you is, yes, a real airplane. And yes, it is a B-29. And almost not, not too limited at that. This is the B-29 that dropped the first atomic bomb. It's called Enola Gay. That is the name of the mother of the pilot, Enola Gay Tibbetts. He named the plane for her the night before this epic mission of dropping the first atomic bomb. All right? The B-29 was, was born in the following way. In the late 1930s, Boeing was delivering the B-17 Strato, uh, oh no, B, uh, Flying Fortress to the Army Air Corps. And so they had a good engineering team. This team began to look forward a little bit and say, what if we were challenged to come up with a super bomber, you know, the next generation bomber? What would it be like? So they began to put some ideas on paper, and the Army found out they were doing it, went out to see them in Seattle and liked what they saw. And the Army guys said to them, why don't you just keep working on these concepts, and we'll go back home and see if we can get a competition going for a new bomber. So they did, and they dreamed up these three specifications. They said, we're worried about a possible coming war in Europe. And the worst case scenario we could think of as planners would be that we might have to do bombing missions in Central Europe and have not one single airport in the entire European theater of operations on the But we would have to fly around places like Iceland, Greenland, Newfoundland, or even farther away, all the way into Central Europe and back. It's far. So they came up with this number. They said, we want you guys to try to design us a plane that can fly for 5,000 miles. What? That's a huge number in those days. It's a huge number in these days for you. <laughs> all right. Um, Beyond that, they said, now the concept will be this. You know how payload works, especially you. Payload is the amount of stuff you can put on the airplane, including crew, passengers, fuel, and bombs. But you can't go above the maximum design gross weight. See? But you can allocate certain parts of payload to different jobs. That is, if you have to take a giant fuel load, you can only take a small weapons load. Vice versa, if you take a giant weapons load, you can only fly a couple hundred miles with a little bit of gas, but that's okay if you only want to go a couple hundred miles. See how that plays? So they said the second specification is on a maximum range bombing mission, 5,000 miles, you have to have enough payload left to carry 2,000 pounds of bombs to the halfway point on the mission. Okay? And the third and last specification was this. They wanted the plane to go 400 miles an hour. Oh, macro, just that very year we had finally got this overpowered hot rod fighter plane to go 400 miles an hour. Now they want this 110,000 pound monster to go 400 miles an hour. Bring your lunch, this is going to take a while. See? All right. So they started. 
The plane became known as the most sophisticated bomber in World War II. I'm going to name for you some of the features that made it that special. When your first specification is to fly really far, farther than any airplane had ever flown uh, unrefueled at to the, that point in time, okay? You need to optimize a thing called efficiency. And we'll define efficiency by this thought. You have a finite amount of fuel on this plane. You really got to fly far. You better use it properly or beautifully. See? All right. So what about efficiency? Efficiency might be miles flown divided by gallons of gas used. Is that reasonable? Who can tell me what type of air vehicle, aircraft, might have the best efficiency of all? Lighter. Who said that? Perfect. Lighter. You know about dividing by zero? Miles flown divided by no fuel used. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You like the numbers? Don't you wish your car could do that? See that glider up there? That silver one? What is it about it that you can see from a distance that you know it's a glider and it's really different? Long, thin wings. Absolutely right. Now, aeronautical engineers like me know that there's a tremendous benefit in a long, thin wing. It cuts down uh, what we call induced drag. It's what you call a high aspect ratio wing. It cuts down induced drag and it makes the thing so efficient Try this one. Many, many years ago when I was an undergraduate at Penn State, I had a classmate who loved gliders, a young boy. Okay? To this day, he is a world-recognized glider champion. And he has flown gliders over a thousand miles. No engine, no landing, nothing. Just get up in the morning and fly all day and come back. A thousand miles with no fuel. Is that good? Sure, it's good. So the guys that had to build an airplane would go 5,000 miles thought, maybe there's something to this long, thin wing thing. We better get on it. So they made a long, thin wing. And if you saw another kind of bomber from World War II compared to this one, you would be amazed. This is truly a long, thin wing. Next, the flaps. You see the flaps on the back of this wing and also on the P-38 right in front of your face here? Everybody knows that when you put flaps down, it's called cambering the airfoil. It allows the airplane to develop more lift at the same speed whenever you put them down. So that these two kinds of airplanes, pretty much right at the same time, came up with a new notion. And that is, don't just put the flaps down, make them travel back, uh, backwards off the wing as well. That concept is called a Fowler flap, F-O-W-L-E-R. And here's how important it is. In the case of the B-29, look how far they move. If you were to take a photograph before and after putting the flaps down from right directly above, you could measure the fact that that wing gets 20% bigger just by putting the flaps down. Does that sound like a good idea when you're taking an overweight aircraft off of a short runway in a hot desert island out there someplace? Uh-huh, that really matters. It's like a magic button. Push this for more lift. Push this for less. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. You know how important that is? Every major air carrier aircraft right here on the Dulles International Airport today over there loading passengers right this minute has Fowler flaps. You know, bingo. Totally true. All those years ago. All right? The next thing are these engines. They are not small. These engines were still in development, basically, uh, when they designed the B-29. Uh, but they ended up putting them through their test routines and getting them finally to work okay. It took a long time. But these are called a Wright, W-R-I-G-H-D, that's the name of the company, R-3350. Well, the R means they're radial engines. Pistons go out in various angles uh, radially from the crankshaft, okay? But the 3350 is what's the magic here. Lots of you guys that have messed with cars all your life, and maybe some ladies, I don't know, know that uh, displacement is kind of like how you measure the size of an engine. And it means, say, cubic inches of displacement of combined cylinders and all. Well, that's all very complicated for a person who doesn't know a lot about that. But the 3350 means 3,350 cubic inch displacement. Does that sound like a lot to anybody? Uh-huh. Say yes. Okay. For those of you who don't know what to say, try this. If you were to go down to your Mercedes dealer today and say, I'm going to buy a new car, 
Uh, uh, no, no, the big one. Right over here. The big one. Okay. Is that the biggest one you got? Okay, that's the one I want. It would probably have about 300 cubic inches of displacement. Of course, we measure it in liters. Now it's an easy conversion. But anyway, it had about 300 cubic inches, and it'd be about maybe 250, 300 horsepower. This is a 2,200 horsepower engine, all right? And it has not one but two turbo superchargers on each engine. We have ourselves a serious power plant here. The next thing I want to highlight is the body of the plane itself. The French have a word for that. It's called fuselage. That's the body of the aircraft. And here, for the first time ever, we have a major heavy bomber that's pressurized. Ah, it's pressurized. That's nice. What good is that? What can you tell you about that? This plane was designed to fly at 30,000 feet. Who knows what the temperature at 30,000 feet is? 45 below zero, bingo. 45 below zero on a standard day. Would you like to go for a 5,000 mile airplane ride at 45 below zero? Is this the only cozy ride? <laughs> Don't go. You know, when you have an open plane, unpressurized plane like a B-17, you know, they had great big cutouts like this big in the back of the fuselage for guys to stick guns out and shoot. It's 45 below zero air coming in there. Holy mackerel. So they're wearing sheepskin lined leather flight suits from the tip of their boots to the top of their head, including a face mask with electric heaters inside. And basically all they were was bulky. You know, they, they still were freezing. And now they're trying to run their guns and stuff with these great big grizzly bear suits on, you know, it's just a mess. The next thing is kind of more important. And that is that the human body was designed to work at sea level. You don't just take somebody and plop them up at 30,000 feet and say, have a nice day. There's a few things we must consider here. You know, I like to push this on your head with kind of a shock and awe story that I know firsthand, kind of firsthand, almost firsthand. Um, I know of a case where an Air Force pilot was in a high performance fighter plane and he was to do this zoom mission to extreme altitudes. Now he had a space suit on. Now that defends you against the problems of taking the pressure off your body, right? He had this space suit on. But anyway, he pulls up like this and he gets up to about almost 60,000 feet and boom, his glove blew off. The suit deflated. He died in the time it would take to say your name. Dead. You can't do that. You can't be at high altitude without pressure on your body. Do you know why? 78% of what we breathe is not oxygen, it's nitrogen. And when the nitrogen gets down into our lungs, it looks around and it says, I could live here. I kind of like it here. And what it does is it dissolves into your blood as a liquid. See, it goes into your bloodstream and it, because of the pressure that's on you, it can exist in a liquid form in your blood. If you take the pressure off your body, the nitrogen kind of thinks like this, physically speaking. It says, I used to be bubbles. I'm going to be bubbles again. Boom! Your entire vascular system is filled with bubbles. How do you think that would work when it gets to your lungs, and your heart, and your brain? You die. You've heard of it, the bends, haven't you? Same kind of thing can happen in flight. Exactly. If you go to extreme altitude, you got problems, I just told you about it. If you go to a medium altitude and have no pressure on your body, the same kind of thing can happen, but it takes a lot longer. It still happens. Okay. All right. The last thing is about breathing. You don't just take somebody and pop them up at 30,000 feet and say, have a nice day. I already told you that. What about your breath? How long has it been since you had a breath? Five seconds? Ten seconds? If you were 30,000 feet without the pressure that you need here at sea level, you would not only need to have some oxygen, everything that goes in your lungs would have to be oxygen. That's called 100% oxygen, not 22% like we have here. 100% oxygen, and it would have to be delivered to your lungs under pressure. It is not fun breathing oxygen for a long time under pressure. I've done it, it's not fun. It's like breathing with someone seated on your chest because the regulator blows your lungs up and you have to force out every breath. See, it's just a mess. In a pressurized aircraft, none of that's true. It's all just great. 
It's a shirt sleeve environment. Until some bad guy shoots a hole in the airplane, everything's fine. All right. All right. Let's get out of that stuff now and go right into the history. You know, don't you, that our president in World War II was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he died during uh, the last couple of months of the war in April 1945. The presidency fell abruptly to a new guy, Harry Truman. Great guy, smart man, but no clue that there were two top secret programs going on in the United States government. One was the Manhattan Project, the design of nuclear weapons, and the other one was the modification of our best bomber to be able to carry such a thing. Okay, good. Uh, Harry Truman was a, a quick study. He learned about these things very quickly, and it was just a few weeks later, honestly, that we won the war in Europe. You know that, don't you? It was in the late spring of 1945, D.E. Day. So we won the war with Germany. So here the new President Truman has to participate in discussions with the Allies about what are we going to do with the world now that we have won the war in Europe. That's what you do after wars, always. See? All right. So they got together in Germany. We just won in Germany. Okay, we can do that. They went to a little town called Potsdam, which is a bit southwest of Berlin, and they met in the July of, in July of 1945. And they had to decide how do you carve up the Middle East? How do you carve up North Africa? How do you carve up Europe? You know, you know all this stuff, right? It's true. So they met there in the whole month, and at the end of that time, President Truman realized that. This is all very nice, but we still have a war going on in the Pacific. And we're sick and tired of it. We've lost so many lives, and the future plans which we have are really going to take away a lot more lives. So he said to the other stakeholders in the war in the Pacific, let's write an ultimatum to the Emperor of Japan, see if we can make this nonsense stop. So they did. And you guys know what it's called, don't you? The Potsdam Proclamation, you've heard of it? I have a copyright. And I'm going to read you two sentences from it. The first sentence is what you'd expect. The last sentence is not what you'd expect. But it's important. We call upon the government of Japan to proclaim now the unconditional surrender of all Japanese armed forces and to provide proper and adequate assurances of their good faith in such action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, okay. Try this. The alternative for Japan is prompt and utter destruction. So it's kind of like saying, Mr. Emperor, do you have any idea what we're talking about? No way. No way. Right? You know, whenever there's a big war going on, you've got hawks and doves back home, you've got the people that want to fight to the last man, and you have people that want to give up yesterday. They always do. Japanese had this too. But they also had a cultural problem, and that was they considered their emperor to be like a god. And every person felt that they could, they would do anything to avoid embarrassing their emperor. So when you got all of these external pressures about how do you answer a thing like this, they were in a great big dilemma. You know what they did? Nothing. They couldn't come up with an answer. So when you send someone an ultimatum and they don't answer it, guess what? That's an answer. So President Truman decided to tell the people over in an island in the Western Pacific called Tinian, which we had just won back from the Japanese that same year, he, he decided to tell them what those 15 brand new B-29s were doing sitting there. No one on that base had a clue why they were there until then. He also allowed them to know what was in that ship in the lagoon right beside the runways, the USS Indianapolis with a top secret cargo on board. Any ideas? So then. On the night between the 5th and the 6th of August, 70 years ago, that plane right there loaded up one nuclear weapon in its forward bomb bay, which is right there. And it took off at 2.30 in the morning with a crew of 12, and they flew all night up to the Japanese islands, no 270 miles. When they got there in the morning, about 8.15 in the morning, they uh, were 30,000 feet, 31 actually, and they had a target list with them that says you can only strike one of these five targets. Pick one, 
but you must be able to see it from your bombing altitude. You have to physically identify it visually. So they found the city of Hiroshima, they dropped the bomb, they turned, and they went back to where they came from, uh, down at uh, Tinian Island. Three days later, another silver plate like this, B-29, different one, with a different crew, I get this point, and a totally different kind of nuclear device. Took off, flew to the Japanese islands, found the city of Nagasaki, dropped the bomb, went back to Tinian. A few days later, on the 15th of August, the Emperor of Japan declared publicly to the world, we unconditionally surrender and World War II was over. Now, just to stick this stuff in your mind a little bit, I'm going to show you these two weapons. This is a full-scale model of the first one. It's called Little Boy for a reason which will become very apparent in the next minute. It was a circular cylinder like these posts right here. It was 28 inches across. It was 10 feet long with the fins in the back. Yes, that's my wife there. Weighed 9,700 pounds, and it was a uranium-based device. Okay. Now, the reason it was called Little Boy is by comparison to the other one, it was little. The next bomb was not little. It was called Fat Man. How do you like those? Little Boy and Fat Man. Here's the big one. That engine is bigger than one of these engines. It's five feet across. It weighs more than 10,000 pounds. And it is a plutonium-based weapon. No comparison with the first one whatsoever. Different shape, different size, and totally different physics involved in operating that weapon. See? Isn't that kind of bold? In the whole history of aviation history and warfare, we had only dropped one nuclear weapon in combat by then. And here, just three days later, we're sending up an entirely different design. Amazing. Any questions about any of that? What? What about the issue of contact with the city? I don't know. Um, positive identification, maybe. No, they didn't have great weapon system uh, aids during those years. They did have a radar on it. You can see it right there. But, you know, if, if you've ever tried to operate a radar, you might know that it, it has to be a modern, darn good radar in order to get 